welcome to another new episode of Strange Encounters, where today we continue to examine the mysterious and unexplained world of alien and UFO encounters. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and hit the notification bell so you won't miss an episode. It really helps the channel a lot. You can send your unexplained and strange encounters to verystrangeencounters at gmail.com. Join us on the Strange Encounters subreddit at r slash verystrangeencounters. You can donate to the channel through buymeacoffee.com or become a member on our Patreon site. The links are in the description below the video. With all the housekeeping done, sit back, relax, and prepare to be amazed by the mysteries of the universe on this episode of Strange Encounters. Aliens Wearing Hooded Outfits by Island Girl 111. Serious question, as crazy as it might sound, I'm wondering if anyone has had any experiences with aliens in hooded outfits or could point me towards any information about something similar. I've been lurking on Reddit for years. I lost access to my first account and just recently made this one. I used to casually check the UFO thread and about a year ago, I saw someone commenting about two hooded aliens, one taller, one shorter. That detail about the height freaked me out a bit. I haven't been able to find that comment again. I've been thinking to share my family's story ever since, but something always got in the way, until I got a call from my mom today. So, the main story is something that happened to my mother. She says that in 1988, when my brother was an infant, she woke up at night because he was making a weird crying sound. She sat up in bed and looked over. His crib was at the window, and right next to it, two figures were standing and looking down at the baby while he was crying. They were wearing grayish beige outfits with hoods, and one was about one and a half feet taller than the other. She couldn't see their faces as the streetlights were shining in from behind them, but she instinctively knew they were not human. My mom says she completely freaked out and reached behind her for my father to wake him up. She tried shaking him, but he wouldn't wake up, so she turned around and shook him with both hands. When she looked back, the alien figures were gone. She got my brother from the crib and couldn't fall asleep at all that night. Honestly, we have always made fun of her and told her it was a dream or night terror, but she insists it wasn't, and she remembers everything too clearly. My mom is very down-to-earth and logical. She's a doctor. She doesn't watch any sci-fi and has never told us anything else weird like this. I told her about the comment I found here on Reddit about the two hooded aliens and she was kind of excited about it and joking why we never believed her. Today, she called me about something unrelated, and at the end of the conversation, mentioned that my four-year-old nephew, the child of the same brother from the first story, told her that aliens came to him at night and wanted to be friends, but he didn't want to talk to them. I joked whether she asked him what they were wearing, and she said that she didn't have a chance as the kids were talking over each other as usual when they arrived, but she will ask when he wakes up from his nap. Mom texted tonight saying that she later asked my nephew what the aliens looked like, and he said mom and kid were wearing hoods, so he couldn't see, but the dad had very colorful hair. Mom asked him what he means by the colorful hair, and he replied, just go visit them and have a look yourself. Mom told them aliens live high up behind the stars, so how can she go there? And my nephew just rolled his eye. I was suspicious that she might have mentioned the hoods to my nephew, but she said no. She literally just asked what did his aliens look like. This got me thinking about another family visitor story, this time from my great-grandmother from my mother's son. When I was a teenager, she told me that my grandpa was a super chill baby and slept all through the night pretty much since he was about two months old. Her husband insisted the boy sleeps in his own room, but they never closed the doors. 
She woke up one night when the baby was around seven months old because he was screaming like crazy. She got up, walked through the hallway and into the baby room and completely froze because there was a tall, hooded figure standing and looking down towards the crib. She said she panicked and wanted to run to wake her husband up, but her mother instincts kicked in and she went over and picked up my grandpa. To get to the crib, she had to walk past the figure, so she just turned her back to him and quickly walked past, picking up her son, held him to her chest, and once again turned her back to the figure and ran back to her bedroom. She managed to wake up her husband, and he went to check, but of course, no one was in the kid's room. Gran always said it was a ghost. This happened in the early 1940s. I just thought it's strange how all these situations had creatures wearing hoods. It's not a common way that aliens are depicted in movies or popular culture. So, I'm curious to see if anyone else has encountered any hooded visitors. Strange Events Involving a Mantis Being by AEK1128 Last night, I had a dream that there was a mantis being in my bedroom doorway. It was so tall, its head almost touched the top of the doorframe. I don't typically remember any of my dreams, but this dream stuck out because it scared the heck out of me and I remember getting goosebumps all over my body. The second I saw it, I woke up, still with goosebumps all over me. When I opened my eyes, my dog was standing right next to me, staring at me, panting and shaking. My dog is seven years old. The only time he has ever acted like that is during thunderstorms. I've never seen him act like that without it storming outside. So I picked up my phone and looked at the weather radar and it appears to be typical January weather where I live in Ohio, like 15 degrees and obviously no thunderstorms. So that was odd. Anyway, my dog gets up in bed with me, something he never does. He lays in my bed and stares at the doorframe, just panting and shaking. The same doorframe where I had a dream there was a mantis alien standing a few minutes prior. Could it be a coincidence? Absolutely. Also, my husband was sleeping in bed with our five-year-old because he's been having bad dreams about aliens and has been terrified to be alone in his bed. I have some thoughts that this is all related. Also, does anyone have any thoughts or ideas on how I could help my son with these alien dreams so he's not so scared? I saw a UFO up close by Incarnate Devil. I saw a UFO up close. I feel ready to share my experience with everyone. I live north of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. This took place last summer, at the end of July 2019. It was very dark out, just after 11 p.m. My house is on the second last street in the north of my town. After the town ends, it's all farmland. Some background information. In my youth, I took up skydiving. I have a couple of hundred free fall jumps, mostly from small aircraft. I'm used to spotting planes at altitude. I grew up in Trenton, Ontario, which is an Air Force town. And on the day my family moved in, a voodoo jet, a CF-101, buzzed us. I guess the pilot saw the moving van and welcomed us to the town. As a result of that, at age seven, I've had a fascination with aviation. I've attended many air shows and keep up with aviation technology. Here's my experience. It was garbage day the next day. I was taking the trash to the curb when I noticed an orange light just above the tree line. I thought it was a street light and didn't pay any more attention to it. After I had finished with the garbage, I looked at the light and it was bigger. Now I'm starting to realize this is not a normal light. At first, the only thing I could tell about it was that it was orange, low, and slow. My first thought was a Chinese lantern, and for a minute I watched it thinking just that. It kept the same low altitude, 
less than a thousand feet off the deck, and it was getting closer and closer. At its closest approach, it was less than two kilometers away and less than a thousand feet up in my estimation. Everything around me went silent. Not even the crickets were singing. It was too quiet. The object was the size of a house. It was orange and the surface looked like lava and was rippling like boiling water. No bubbles, but I could see a point where the ripples were emanating from a darker pool on the surface. It looked like a bruise, a darker spot, and it looked like the surface material was welling up from there and spilling over the surface. The entire object was covered in high energy waves, very high frequency waves with sharp points that pulsed over the surface with the darker spot being the epicenter. Each wave moved with a very fast tempo until it reached the terminator and moved around the other side of the object. All waves moved in unison with maybe two tenths of a second between each wave, about four per second. It continued moving from north to south, and once it had moved maybe one kilometer south of my house, it started to rise slowly. After gaining a significant amount of altitude, easily over 5,000 feet, but less than 10,000 feet, it disappeared. I heard a low but clearly audible popping sound and three to four reverberations from it. My guess is that I heard the atmosphere rushing to fill a void left behind when it left. I was looking almost straight up at the object when it went vertical to leave. I tried to record it. I got maybe 30 seconds worth of footage, but my cell phone camera could only catch a point of light like a star. It has no details like those that I saw with my eyes. I wish I could have captured the details better, but it does show when it vanished. The entire experience was maybe three minutes. I reported my experience to MUFON, and a couple of days later, I was contacted for an interview. I told my story, and after the investigator was done, he told me the same object was spotted three hours later in the Muskoka area, which is approximately 150 kilometers away from my area. It was using some sort of light ray to scan the ground. I was told it was recorded on video as well. I was never sent the video of the other sighting, but I was sent a few screen caps of that video. The object does not show up well at night on cell phone cameras. I suspect whatever this object is using on the surface doesn't allow cameras to photograph it well. I don't know what this was, but I know what it wasn't. It wasn't a plane, or a helicopter, or a hot air balloon being flown at night for whatever reason you would do that, or a Chinese lantern. It wasn't a drone, it wasn't a blimp, it wasn't ball lightning, and it wasn't swamp gas. It appeared to be under intelligent control as it moved horizontally for a long time, and then vertically. This experience changed me. I'm always looking up now. I know we are not alone in the universe, and that knowledge is profound and humbling. I'm adding what the investigators shared with me. Their correspondence is as follows. Hello, Incarnate Devil. Hope you're doing well. Just for an update, I've talked to the other two witnesses that filmed the same looking object that you had. What's interesting in their case is that the object actually appeared two nights in a row. They had high-end binoculars while observing the object and were able to see the craft up close both nights. They said the camera does not do any justice to what they saw. They described it as a large circular object. After they began recording, it started to flash multiple colors. Once it stopped flashing, they were able to see a faint red beam of sorts emitting from below the craft. They initially only submitted one video from the same night you saw it, but they are also sending me the second night's video and pictures they were able to take. Because they had seen this object two nights in a row, I've asked them to conduct an experiment, that if they are awake tonight, to check the sky to see if it's back. I would like to ask you the same thing. If you are able to, and up for a little experiment, 
can you please go outside and check the sky around the same time you saw the object? Have your camera or phone ready in case it appears. If it does, try to record the entire event from when you spot it until you either lose it or it disappears. Only zoom in after you get about 30 seconds to a minute of recording. Cell phone cameras are not made for night video. So, when they zoom in on a distant object, the aperture in the camera really distorts the image. The object will appear as a diamond shape from the camera's aperture. However, if the object is fairly close, then by all means zoom in. As well, try to get some rooftops in the video to help determine some scale to the object. You're a smart man, so use your discretion. You know how to obtain quality footage. Hope to talk to you soon. Chief Investigator, Ontario, MUFON, Canada. I did have a second sighting after this took place. I wanted to close with what I feel is a very important message to get out there. When you have dominion over life, you must do all you can to protect it. Abduction 2015, California, by Deleted Reddit User. Just a note, before I read this next story, I just wanted to say that I was unable to contact the original author of the story because they had deleted the Reddit account they used to post it. So, even though I'm going to include this story, I'm not able to verify its veracity. Let's continue with the story. In July of 2015, back when I was 19, I lived in a house in Southport, Sacramento with three other friends. I woke up one night to a light coming through the ceiling of my room and it lifted me out of my bed. Next thing I know, I'm in some kind of chair and unable to control my body, like I was drugged with something. There were guys that were not human men but gray people with large black almond-shaped eyes doing stuff with what seemed like medical instruments and machines. I was very terrified. I was unarmed, naked, unable to move. I was so scared. One of them was touching the machine that put a tube down my throat and into my stomach. His hand got close to my face because he had to adjust something holding my head in place. I remember getting a good look at his hand and eyes. They had long fingers with pads at the tips, sort of like salamanders do, and they don't have fingernails. Their skin is gray, but kind of like a powdery translucent gray. I'm certain that if I was able to move, I could have easily harmed or even killed him and his crew with my bare hands, as they didn't seem like much physically. This is probably why they did something to prevent me from being able to move. My first reaction was to fight back, but I couldn't. They had large heads with small necks, so small and thin it didn't make sense. Their arms and fingers were long and skinny too. I was in a chair with my head and jaw held by something, so I didn't see their feet. I'd say the tallest probably stood about the height of my lowest rib, and for reference, I'm 5'10". The tube machine sucked out the food I ate earlier that day and then was pulled out of me. I don't remember how I got there, but I then remembered being in a cage made of some kind of metal that reminded me of aluminum in a room with curved walls. In front of me was a man who looked a lot like a human talking to a gray person on a window that lit up as a screen like a hologram but not like the Star Wars kind, more like a video call. The man was tall and looked like a human, except that his skin was very white and his hair was blonde and platinum. I've never seen a person with that kind of snow white skin color before. He spoke with a gray person on the hollow screen in a language I didn't understand. He wore a blue flight uniform of some kind. The man was obviously military of some sort, judging by his uniform. The gray person spoke in a language that sounded like birds chirping. Once the call was over, the hollow screen turned into a different display with symbols, and the man turned and walked to me. 
He crouched down and spoke to me in plain American English and said to me, Everything's going to be fine. I'm going to get you out of here and take you home. I was so happy to hear that. He opened the cage and the next thing I know, I fell on top of my bed with my back hitting the mattress first. I immediately got out of bed right after I fell. It was morning when I fell in my bed and I rushed to put on clothes and ran two miles to my brother's apartment in West Sacramento to talk to him about it. I never believed in aliens or anything crammed into the weird science until that night. My brother would stay up late and listen to Coast to Coast and look up weird stuff like that on the web, so I knew he would listen to what I had to say and possibly help calm me down, but I was wrong. He saw how afraid I was and told me it was probably just a bad dream. I didn't want to believe what happened to me either, but if it were a dream, then why did my throat hurt so bad? I moved to Washington the next month, and the day of my flight, I woke up from a dream about fireballs and orbs with the strangest pock burns on my face, hands, and arms, and had faint scars from them. Since then, I've seen flying fireballs above my current residence and have had some items like shoes and a belt mysteriously go missing from my home. I also have a photo on my phone of a black cube-shaped spaceship I saw hiding in the clouds that I took just outside my residence. To this day, I don't know who the man was, what he was, or who or what the gray people with big black eyes are. My reason for sharing this traumatic experience with you all isn't to get you to believe in the existence of other peoples, it's to raise awareness that this happens to people. And I didn't believe 100% that it happens until it happened to me. Whether or not you choose to believe in other people's existence doesn't change the fact that they have affected other people's lives, including mine. I'm going to share this on the sub abductions and maybe I could get help there. It's not something I've been able to just talk about like the weather as I'm afraid of being looked at differently, especially in my professional career. I know what I know is real, and it's frustrating to be looked at like a crazy man for being honest and open about some things. That's been the real traumatic part about it, the way other people treat people who talk about it, who seek help for it. I'm happy to answer any questions about this experience, and I'm hoping to find folks who've had encounters with other star people. In this next segment, we're looking at some of the most classic and well-known cases of encounters with the strange, including sightings of unidentified flying objects, alien abductions, ghost stories, cryptid encounters, and other unexplained phenomena. So, sit back and prepare to be taken on a journey through some of the most captivating and mysterious stories of the strange and unknown. In this episode, we take a look at the Phoenix Lights UFO Incident of 1997. Famous Encounters The Phoenix Lights, 1997 The Phoenix Lights UFO Incident refers to a series of mysterious events that occurred on the evening of March 13, 1997, in and around the Phoenix, Arizona area. The incident is considered to be one of the most significant and widely witnessed UFO sightings in modern history, and has remained a topic of debate and speculation for many years. The incident began at around 7.30 p.m. local time, when people started reporting seeing strange lights in the sky above the city of Phoenix. These lights were reported to be in a triangular formation, which many described as a V-shape and they were visible for several hours. Some witnesses reported that the lights were accompanied by a low-frequency humming sound, while others described them as completely silent. The lights were first noticed by residents of the city of Paulden, Arizona, who reported seeing a formation of four to five bright lights in the sky. Reports of these lights started to spread quickly, and soon they were seen by thousands of people throughout the Phoenix area, including in the cities of Prescott, Prescott Valley, and Dewey. As the night progressed, the lights continued to move in a southerly direction, 
eventually converging above the city of Phoenix to form a single, massive triangular shape that spanned several miles. Witnesses described the shape as being almost identical to a stealth bomber, with a series of bright lights positioned along the underside of the craft. The lights remained visible for several minutes before disappearing behind the nearby Estrella Mountains. The incident was immediately investigated by the United States Air Force, who initially denied any knowledge of the lights. However, several years later, the Air Force released a statement acknowledging that the lights were in fact part of a training exercise involving flares dropped by an A-10 Warthog aircraft from the Maryland Air National Guard. According to the Air Force, the flares were dropped as part of a nighttime training exercise and were meant to simulate the movement of enemy aircraft. Despite the official explanation, many witnesses and UFO enthusiasts continue to maintain that the lights were of extraterrestrial origin. Some have even suggested that the government has covered up the true nature of the incident and that it may have been part of a larger conspiracy involving alien technology and government secrecy. Shortly after the 1997 incident, Arizona Governor Fife Symington held a press conference, joking that they found who was responsible and revealing an aide dressed in an alien costume. Later, in 2007, Symington reportedly told a UFO investigator he'd had a personal close encounter with an alien spacecraft, but remained silent because he didn't want to panic the populace. According to Symington, I'm a pilot, and I know just about every machine that flies. It was bigger than anything that I've ever seen. It remains a great mystery. Other people saw it. Responsible people, Symington said. I don't know why people would ridicule it. The Phoenix Lights UFO incident has been the subject of numerous documentaries, books, and articles, and remains a source of fascination and speculation for many people around the world. The incident has also attracted the attention of several prominent UFO researchers and investigators, many of whom have interviewed witnesses and conducted their own investigations into the matter. Over the years, many witnesses have come forward to share their accounts of the incident. Some have described seeing the lights move in a way that seemed impossible for conventional aircraft, while others have reported feeling a sense of fear or unease while witnessing the lights. Some witnesses have even claimed to have seen strange humanoid figures moving around inside the triangular craft. Despite the controversy and uncertainty surrounding the Phoenix Lights UFO incident, it remains an important event in the history of UFO sightings and has sparked a renewed interest in the study of extraterrestrial life and the possibility of intelligent life beyond our own planet. Thanks for watching another episode of Strange Encounters. We hope you enjoyed hearing about the mysterious and unexplained stories that we shared today. If you haven't already, please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. By doing so, you'll never miss out on any of our future episodes, and you'll help us continue to bring you more fascinating stories and encounters. We love to hear from our viewers, so send your own experiences with the unknown to our email at verystrangeencounters at gmail.com. You can also join us on Reddit at r slash verystrangeencounters. If you enjoyed the video and would like to support us, join our Patreon page or go to buymeacoffee.com, both of which are linked in the video description and in the pinned comment below. Your support really helps this channel continue to bring you new and amazing stories. Thank you again for tuning in to Strange Encounters. We appreciate the support of everyone who listens to the channel. Until next time, take care, stay safe, and watch out for the unknown.